As many of you know, uh, we've, we've been so lucky, I'd say, here in Kansas to have the resource and the relationship and the partnership ultimately here with the Barton School of Business, but specifically the Center for Real Estate. And the efforts that Stan has put together um, have really made a difference and an impact, starting really initially, I think, kind of here on a local basis within Wichita, but then that expanded to a statewide basis. And we're pretty lucky. Not all states have what we have. And so Dr. Stan Longhoffer is professor and Stephen L. Clark, chair of real estate and finance in the Barton School of Business here at Wichita State, and is the founding director of the Center for Real Estate. In this role, Dr. Longhoffer provides research and services and educational programs to real estate professionals throughout the region, and he's also the author of the Center's annual housing market forecast. His insights regarding real estate market conditions are widely quoted in local and national media outlets, including The Economist, um, uh, Forbes, USA Today, and Christian Science Monitor. He's also been featured as an op-ed columnist in The Washington Post and Wall Street Journal's online edition. Dr. Longhoff earned his PhD in economics from the University of Illinois, although he's a true shocker at heart. Um, and he also worked as an economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland prior to coming to Wichita State. Because of his deep engagement with the real estate professionals throughout the region, RSCK, he's been recognized as the 2019 Citizen of the Year, and in 2021, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Kansas CCIM chapter um, and WSU Center for Real Estate for his contributions specifically to the commercial real estate industry here in Wichita. But again, glad to have the data for everybody today. I know there's lots of questions in the market. What's going on? You know, and Stan is really, really good at looking in the rearview mirror at the data we have, predicting based on what's coming, um, and that's what you're going to gain here today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stan. Thank you, sir. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Brady. So I am, of course, Stan Longhoffer, director of the Center for Real Estate here at Wichita State University, and it's my great pleasure to bring you this year's Wichita housing market forecast. You have at your desk copies of this year's forecast publication. Um, there are also additional copies kind of near the back of the room that you're welcome to take with you, and lots of copies at the Realtor's office, at the RSCK office. Take them, pick them up, take them back to your offices. I, I know that many of you use them in listing presentations or include them in um, relocation packets or other marketing materials you use. That's what they're there for. I'm sure the realtors would love to get them out of their office and into yours. And I will say over the last few years, we have run out. So if you think, oh, I'll get them later, they may or may not be there later, so get them now. These are available because of the generous support of Security First Title and Meritrust Credit Union. They have been longtime friends of the Center for Real Estate, longtime friends of the Realtors of South Central Kansas. Can we give them all an a round of applause? <laughs> all of you know what it's like when home sales activity has been down this year and you feel that pinch. But remember that both of these two sponsors that we have, they're not only pinched because of a decline in sales transactions, they're pinched because of a decline in refinancing activity, which has been even worse. And so for them to continue to support us and do things, I think we, we should be especially grateful at a time like this. I also want to give my regular thanks to the uh, realtor associations across the state um, was talking, was it with you, Monica, talking about the time that we've done this and, and that my partnership and the things that I've had with all of you has been one of the best parts of my job. And I am so grateful for that relationship and uh, appreciate, appreciate all of you. And it's because of this relationship and the par partnership that we've had that I'm able to do the work that I've done. So again, very thank you very much. Oh, don't want to forget, my slides are available now on the Center for Real Estate website. You are welcome to take pictures, post on social media, do things like that. But if you want to have the slides, the hard slides, if you go to our website, wichita.edu slash real estate, you will see right up there the Housing Forecast Conference presentation, and you can download those slides now. That is not a QR code. So please don't blame me for wherever your phone takes you if you click on that thing on the right. That actually is about tied to our theme that we had. You know, every year we try and do a theme, and this year's theme was market distortions. 
And it's reflecting the fact that, you know, when we do comparisons in economics, we often ask, where are we now compared to, say, a year ago? Well, a year ago was not a normal environment. And so I think it's important to take a look back several years to get a sense of what normal is and what normal ought to be as, as we go forward with this. And so the theme that we went with was this distortion like on a television set to when you get the pixelization or something. So um, kind of throw back to the, to the old fuzzy you know, reception on, the, on your TV. And so with all of that preliminary out of the way, um, I want to talk a little bit about what goes into the housing forecast. And I haven't included anything about the employment picture because, um, because we already heard about that. The short answer from the Center for Economic Development Business Research is that the employment situation in the Wichita area is actually pretty strong. Um, the job growth is, is some of the stronger job growth that we've seen outside the pandemic rebound over the last several years. So um, from a standpoint of the housing forecast, there's nothing about the labor market right now that would cause me to be concerned about demand for housing, okay? That should be a big positive on demand. So the other side that I wanna look at and I'll spend some time talking about is our, our mortgage markets and what's happening with financing. And we are very, very aware of how mortgage rates have increased so dramatically over the past uh, little over a year now uh, that they've been increasing. That increase that we've seen, that's one of the sharpest that we've ever seen uh, historically. But from a perspective, you know, it is important to recognize that right now we're sitting in that 7.5% range for the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. Um, that actually, I really want to highlight you and have you go and look at things prior to the financial crisis. This shaded region right here in 2008 and 2009, that is the Great Recession and the financial crisis. And ever since then, the Federal Reserve has been so deeply involved directly in the mortgage market by buying mortgage-backed securities that we really have to go back more than 15 years to find a normal period. And when you do that, and you go back to where we were prior to the financial crisis, our mortgage rates right now are not outside the range of normal where we were in that time when we had relatively low inflation, good healthy growth, and the Fed not messing around in financial markets. So the question that we have going forward is where do we think mortgage rates will go over the next year or two? And spoiler alert, my belief is that we've just about topped out in terms of that mortgage rate increase. As a matter of fact, I've been a little surprised that we've seen some increases over the last uh, few weeks here. But again, everything that looks at the fundamentals of it, I just don't see there being a lot of upward pressure on mortgage rates going forward. So let me talk about the things that go into the mortgage rates and why that's what I think. The first is inflation expectations. The top line on this graph is the, is the year over year headline inflation rate. You know, how much have consumer prices increased over the past year? And we're all very aware of how sharply they increased here uh, over the last couple of years. That was not really what was driving the increase in mortgage rates, however. Because if you look at the bottom line, uh, the green line at the bottom, that's a measure of expected inflation from financial markets, okay? The, the red line is, is a survey of households of their inflation expectations going forward, but the green line is like looking at the Vegas line. It's a place where people are betting literally hundreds of billions of dollars buying treasury securities, and there are two different types of treasury securities that we can look at. One that's traditional, it, it pays you back money with, with inflate, dollars that will be eroded by inflation. And the other is a special treasury security called a TIPS, or Treasury Inflation Protected Security, that your investment, your, when you buy that treasury security, you are protected 
on the back end for any actual inflation that occurs. And the reason I mention that is that the difference in interest rates between those two types of treasury security, one that doesn't have inflation protection and one that does, that difference in interest rate is a measure of what financial markets believe inflation will be over the coming years. And you can see that measure never went up as high as headline inflation did. And right now, it's sitting at around 2.2%. That's within striking distance of the Federal Reserve's 2% inflation target. And so that suggests that those really, really high interest rates that we had going back into the early 1980s and mid-1980s, all of that was driven because of high inflation. And so you built in these high inflation expectation premiums into the mortgage rate. If markets are believing that inflation is going to be, on average, 2.2% over the next five years, then that suggests that we should be actually in, in relatively low inflation period. And that doesn't give us the, the, the push, the impetus, to drive mortgage rates up significantly higher. Okay, So that's the first reason why I think we topped out. The second reason that I think we've topped out is really a question about what drives um, the mortgage, um, what, what's the underlying factor outside of inflation that drives mortgage rates? And that is the 10-year treasury rate. It is a benchmark against which a lot of other interest rates are measured, but especially the mortgage rate. And so you can see on this chart, the blue line at the top is the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. Okay. And then the red line below it is the 10-year treasury rate, or what the federal government pays to borrow money over 10 years. Notice that those two move really in lockstep very closely. The, the federal government pays a lower interest rate than you and I do for our mortgages. I wish people thought I was as good a credit risk as Uncle Sam, but it is what it is. The green line at the bottom Oh, I'm sorry. Let, hold on just a second. Just let me mention one thing here. So part of what's really driven up mortgage rates here recently has been that increase in the 10-year treasury, right? The 10-year treasury has been going up. And very recently, it's gone up even further. I actually, if I go back and I look at this, again, go back to the pre-2008 period here, we're now back at a place where the 10-year treasury rate is back at a normal level before the Fed began all of its quantitative easing. I tend to believe that this is back to where the 10-year treasury ought to be. But I will mention Paul Krugman, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist. He does a column for the New York Times. He wonks out. And he is very much on record as believing this is a temporary blip and that the lower 10-year treasury is actually something that we should expect. His arguments for that have to do with demographics and the low birth rate that we have, which is driving down what we call the real risk-free interest rate. But he admits that economists have different views on this. I tend to believe that that 4% rate is much more in there rather than more of a 2% rate for that 10-year treasury. If he's right, the 10-year treasury coming down should also pull down the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. If he's not right, we've reached about the peak, about we're back to normal. Okay, So again, the upward pressure isn't there. If anything, on this piece, maybe there's room for some downward movement. But then the green line at the bottom is the one that I want to highlight. And that is the difference between the 10-year treasury and the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. How much of a premium do you and I pay for our mortgages compared to what the 10-year treasury is? That's this risk premium. And if you go back historically, again, dating back to 1985, the average is about 1.7% is what that risk premium for 30-year mortgages is. Right now, that premium is just a hair under 3%. It's incredibly high. We've only been at this high level, about 3%, once back in the early 80s, once uh, in the Great Recession period. This is an abnormally high period. I don't know why. 
Okay? I don't know why that mortgage risk premium is so high right now. But the thing that I take from this is that when, it goes, when that risk premium goes up, historically it has tended to be a relatively short-term phenomenon. Okay? And so if that mortgage risk premium comes back down, say, from 3% to 2% or below that, that would cause, without Treasury rates moving, that would cause 30-year fixed mortgage rate to fall down 100 basis points, or from about 6.5% down to, I'm sorry, 7.5% down to 6.5%. That is why I'm actually very optimistic that we should see mortgage rates fall over the coming year. We are, inflation seems to be under control. We, 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 that, that pressure is not there, so the impetus for it to go up further isn't there. And the mortgage risk premium is exceptionally high right now. If that comes down, that will bring the, the mortgage rate for, down. And so that forecast, the National Association of Realtors, I actually used their forecast this year. That's the green line on this. They're forecasting that the 30-year fixed mortgage rate will fall to 6% by the end of next year. Some of you may remember that in past years, I've used the Mortgage Bankers Association's forecast. When I went to press with these booklets, they were forecasting it to fall down to like 4.5% by the end of next year. And I said, no, I just, I can't swallow that kind of a decrease. They have since increased their estimate up into the mid fives, but that's still lower than I think is really realistic. I don't formally forecast the mortgage rate. And so I haven't done, crunched all the numbers the way they have. But if you put my feet to the fire and you said, where do you think mortgage rates will go next year? I think six and a half percent is not an unrealistic guess, okay? So a little higher than what realtors are, are, are expecting, but within that same framework. So that affects what I have going forward with, with all of this. And so what do we see in the housing markets? Well, none of these pictures are going to be particularly surprising. However, how many of you here were, in, were working as realtors back in 2002? I've got a few of you, but a lot of you weren't, right? How many of you were working as realtors prior to the financial crisis, Went, weren't through as a realtor during the financial crisis back? Okay, so there are more of you who are in that era. I'm gonna argue that where we are right now um, and, and things that we, the, the normal, you have to really go prior to the financial crisis to really get to a world where things were really normal for housing markets. And so looking at this, the, the blue bars are the sales reported by the South Central Kansas Multiple Listing Service, and the red line is the moving average to get through the seasonality. And a couple things I wanted to kind of point out here. You go back in the early 90s, and we were seeing some good, steady, I'm sorry, the early 2000s, we were seeing some good, steady growth in home sales. And then, when the housing market peaked, we were really accelerating, okay? A lot of home sales activity. We leveled off for a couple years, and then when the financial crisis really took in, we had home sales activity that dropped dramatically. A lot of that was driven because the financial markets, um, it was very difficult, you know, underwriting standards became overly restrictive. It became very, very difficult to get financing. And so that had a big in impact on that. It took us several years to recover, really getting back to almost 2013, 2014, to kind of get back to a level that had recovered from all that financial crisis. And since then, we'd been steadily increasing, steadily increasing. And if you remember my forecasts, in 2018 and 2019, my forecast was essentially home sales activity will be flat in the coming year. And my reason was not a lack of demand, but a lack of supply, that we'd begun to work down inventories. Um, our forecast for this year is that sales activity will be down a little over 10%. Now, those of you who've been paying attention to the monthly statistical reports, you will note here, oh, I had it here, year to date, oh, I lost my cheat sheet here. Uh, that's an idiot of me. My year to date, we're down, what, 15%, something like that? 
So that's less of a decline than where we are so far. But if you think about when things really started to tank at the end of last year, it was October, November, December. That's when things really began to fall off. And so my point here is that I think the worst of the year-over-year -year declines is behind us. And that's how we'll end up a little bit better than where we are right now. If we're just even going compared to last year, we'll be there. Our forecast for next year is basically flat. Okay. Again, I don't think that that's being driven by demand. Employment situation is good, and I'm forecasting mortgage rates to fall. So the problem isn't that households can't buy a house because of their income or being able to get financing. The problem is the inventory issue. And so again, I wanted to give a really long historic picture. This goes back to 2002 with the SCK MLS numbers there. And you can see we were up over about 4,000 homes for sale going back in the early 2000s to the, to the early teens. And while we certainly had excess inventory in 2011 and 2012, we whittled that away for a long time. And by the time we hit 2019, it was averaging about 2,000 homes that were available for sale on the market. Yes, the numbers have come up here in the last recent months, but we're still far below where we were in 2019, a time when we already said, as Dr. Louts mentioned, we are hitting critical levels of a shortage of inventory. Okay, so those, those inventories are incredibly low. We measure balance in the housing market through that month supply. My shading for four to six months doesn't show up very well on this particular screen. But essentially, we think that's a balanced market. There's nothing magic about that. It's, it's simply a, a, a historical rule of thumb that we've used. Just because we're above a six-month supply doesn't mean it's a buyer's market if buyers, aren't, buyers and sellers aren't acting that way. Just because we're below a four-month supply doesn't automatically make it a seller's market. Depends on how people behave. There's no question, prior to the pandemic, we were down to a two-month supply. It was absolutely, definitely a seller's market. The pandemic responses that the federal government had absolutely sent demand through the roof. I don't know where you found the homes to sell over the last few years, um, but, but you sold them and drove down inventories where I had some of you talking about it wasn't month's supply, it's not even day's supply, it's hours' supply. You know, how much do you have out there? And so we're getting close to that 2% level where we were back in 2019. But again, how many of you in 2019 thought it was a bad market? Right? No one thought it was a bad market in 2019. Don't compare yourself to the last couple of years. A couple of other pictures that I think still suggest, yes, we are still in a seller's market. Obviously, individual circumstances may vary. Individual investor performance will vary. Um, but, but, you know, so how fast are homes selling? Median days on market is still, you're down uh, about a week Median days on market, now I was just talking, who was it here that was talking with saying you're starting to see things sit a little bit longer right now? And so things can change, and I only see things, you know, as an economist, we drive through the rear view mirror, right? We look backwards and trust that we can, and we always miss those hairpin curves, don't we? Um, but it's still very, very quickly. The, the, a lot of the homes that are selling are still selling very, very quickly. We also are seeing an in, uh, still a very high number of homes that are selling for a premium either at or above the original list price. You're still above 50% of all homes that are selling like that. More normal period, you go back again, prior to the financial crisis, you sat pretty consistently at about 40% of homes and most of those were selling at list price, not above list price. Okay, so again, this, this also leads me to believe we are still have room to go before we get out of what would be a, a seller's market. 
And so with all of that, of course, we had this absolutely insane home price appreciation. Wichita prices topped out a year ago at about 17% year-over-year percentage change. Right now, it's sitting at about, uh, I think, if I remember right, Wichita's sitting at about a 7% increase year-over-year change in the second quarter. Our forecast is that that rapid home price appreciation is slowing. But I want you to note here, the important line on this graph, it's not the slope that matters. It's where are you relative to zero. The fact that this is a downward sloping line simply means that we aren't appreciating as fast as we were before. But we are still appreciating. Home values are still going up. In fact, I think what's happening is that we're reverting back to a more normal pace of appreciation. Our forecast for this year is a 4.2% increase and another 3.4% next year. That is really solid, healthy, typical appreciation for the Wichita market. And if we're in a world where inflation gets back down to that inflation target of 2%, that is 1.5% to 2% real growth in the value of your home, making a housing investment still a very, very good choice for people. For those people, your buyers or others out there who are thinking, I'm going to wait for prices to crash, and then I'm going to go in and buy, I don't think it's realistic for them to expect that. There's just nothing about the market now that really compares to the world we were in back in 2008, 2009, 10, and so forth. So why do we have this shortage of inventory? Again, I wanted a really long-term picture. So this goes all the way back to 1990, looking at single-family building permits in the Wichita area, and you can see we were bouncing around between, say, 150 and 220 uh, permits a month, again, all the way from the late 1990s all the way through the early 2000s. And then after the financial crisis, new home construction absolutely cratered nationwide, and it never fully recovered. New home construction market was particularly hard hit by the increase in mortgage rates over the last year. When I talk to all of you and I talk to home builders, that entry level segment of the market, I don't know, can you really call a $400,000 home an entry level home? But that's really kind of the starting point for a lot of new home construction, 350, 400,000. Those buyers were most deeply affected by the increase in mortgage rates and their ability to afford and to be able to buy. So here's one where that, that impact has really hit us. Again, if we're not gonna be building replacement homes and building new homes, it's going to be difficult for us to address the full inventory issue, okay? Now there is one bright spot here that I have, which is that I do think that two family homes, duplexes or what I call twin homes, can help fill some of that gap. You'll notice here that ever since, you know, after the financial crisis, we started to see a slow but steady and now very rapid increase in two-family building permits compared to what we have with single-family building permits. Now, a lot of that construction has been what I call two-unit apartment complexes, right? It's, it's a development that's been done that it's, that's, it's, a, and it's gonna be sold as, as a block of homes, duplexes, to an investor that are all going to be renter occupied. But I think we're also starting to see more of these units that are the two family split lot designed where it's least possible or easier to sell it as an owner occupied home for each side. And those twin homes can be a way to get in with a little bit lower lot price, a little bit lower construction price, to hit more of that sweet spot of the market, could we get some of these built where we were in at the $250,000 price point for a, a good size home? That would really help start to help us getting into uh, some of the inventory issues that we have. So I'm hopeful about that. Um, so what is our new home construction forecast? 
We, we forecast, again, that I think the worst is behind us with this, and we're actually forecasting an increase for next year, primarily due to that mortgage rate decrease. Um, if mortgage rates do come down 100 basis points over the next year, that will help unlock some of those buyers that have been, that have been priced out of the market right now, and so that could help us to begin to build that. But it's going to take us a long time. Uh, these numbers don't show you know, the periods where we were doing several thousand new homes a month, a uh, year, compared to where we are here. So it'll take us a long time to get through that. That's our overall forecast. And I want to thank again Security First Title and Meritrust Credit Union. And with that, I will answer questions. So questions, criticisms, <laughs> disagreements, yes. So, so the question is, I, I don't quite get what you're saying. If all these duplexes are for renter occupied, not owner occupied, how are they going to solve our, our, our uh, inventory problem in the housing market? Great question. I think that it resolves it in several ways. It doesn't resolve it. it. It eases it in several ways. Number one is to remember that owner occupancy versus renter occupancy. A, a, so how, how does the Census Bureau define a household? A household is a group of people living together in a single housing unit, okay? It doesn't matter if it's owner-occupied, if it's renter-occupied, it doesn't matter if it's a family, if it's an individual, if it's a group of roommates, that's a household. Increasing the number of housing units creates more spaces, more housing units for households to move into. Okay, so it, it eases that demand. Now, the movement between owner-occupied and renter-occupied, I'm actually relatively sanguine about that. If we have a situation where we build lots and lots of rental units, and we build all these rental units, and as a result, we have relatively more rental housing stock than owner-occupied housing stock, that's going to affect rents in the market, right? That's going to affect landlords who now may say, you know what, I'm not earning the kind of return. I'm having too many vacancies. I'm having difficulty here. I'm going to sell some of that stock off because prices are so high in the owner-occupied side of the market. If we get more housing units built, they can transition and move themselves into the owner-occupied or renter-occupied sides of the market as buyers, as, how, as the market d dictates. The, uh, but the other thing I would say is that some of these, and especially in more recent years, have begun to be some of these where they are lot splits. And I prefer to call these twin homes, okay? And I, I, I want to kind of encourage builders to be thinking about, can we build these and sell them as owner-occupied units? In Lawrence, that twin home market for a long, long time was the starter home market. It was the entry-level market for a lot of home buyers. Matter of fact, this is one thing that I was... I think one of the challenges in one of the things that Dr. Louts mentioned, where she talked about the median age of first-time home buyer is now the same as what it was 20 years ago for the median age of the move-up buyer, right? One of the things that has happened as that median age of the first-time buyer has gone up is their expectations. They, they want to move into the move-up home immediately. So here's the other thing that I think will help with all of this, is if we can really help create a culture, once again, of starter homes and sweat equity, right? If we can get, I, I almost wondered whether we should go and, get, and, and, and reinstate, uh, not, not shop class per se, but, but reinstate a, a uh, home remodeling class in high schools where people learn that yes, they can do a lot of these things on their own, and that that, we, we do have some housing stock out there that is locked up because it doesn't meet the demands and the needs. Some of that becomes just low-end rental housing, but some of it could be renovated, renovated, and it could actually be brought into the market that would, would fit you know, that, that demand for some of that more starter home market. I was talking with a real estate investor uh, 
few months ago, and he was talking about with the higher rates that he's paying for his commercial loans for his investment portfolio, that it's harder for him to buy rentals and make the deal work as a rental when he buys it and renovates it. And so he's doing more of flipping and reselling. And that, too, is a way where if we can get some of those people, the entrepreneurs who are doing that type of business, to actually translate that back into the market for resale, that could also help resolve it. But if fixing that inventory of lower-end housing stock, I think, is a part of the picture, and adding two family homes. Sorry, that was a much longer answer than you wanted. So, all right, other questions? Back in the back. So the question is, do I have any projections for building cross, lumber, concrete? No, I don't. Um, you know, the standard stock answer that we gave when I was at the Fed for interest rates is they will fluctuate. Um, <laughs> I am hopeful that a lot of, you know, that, that crazy time that we had with the pandemic and all of those supply chain issues and all those really, really rapid price increases that we saw we aren't, I don't think there's any reason that we should see that again. Those supply chain issues have, have, have slowly begun to work themselves out. It's a little surprising to me that, um, that some of those prices didn't come back down a little bit further when we were done. Uh, so, but I don't think we'll necessarily see rapid increases like that, but I'm, uh, evidently at this point we're not seeing them come down. So um, that's about all I can say. I, I would focus on the National Association of Home Builders for those kind of forecasts. Yes? So I don't think I'm familiar with a change in down payment standards uh, in terms of, of, of the market. I know that their President Biden just recently here announced some things related to uh, some home ownership and programs, but I just saw that in the paper, I think, yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to process all of that. Uh, my short answer to a lot of those things is I, I tend to be skeptical of, of of government moves, whether it's federal government or local government moves, in really moving the needle on any of those things. And so uh, underlying demand fundamentals are, are pretty strong in the housing market right now. It's the supply issues. And so you know, that, that's the side of things that we, we really need to, to work through. So I think I saw another hand down here. Yeah, so the question related to you know, the, the increase of uh, investor purchasers um, and has that ended up contributing to the rise in the age of first-time home buyers. First things first, I, I make a real distinction between, um, you don't want to call them mom and pop, but you know, somebody who has 100 or 200 units in a Wichita market and doing that, I wouldn't call that an institutional investor. Institutional investor would be Wall Street money coming in. And to my knowledge, we've not really seen that sort of thing happen here in Wichita uh, with Wall Street dollars coming in. And, and everything I understand in the markets where they've gone in, they're beginning to pull out because they're not getting the returns that they thought they would. But still, we've seen a big increase in the number of in, you know, just small investors who are coming in and buying units and holding relatively good-sized portfolios. I don't think that's been affecting the age of the first-time home buyer. I think the age of the first-time home buyer has been affected by generational shifts and preference shifts that have happened among the buyer side of things. We've all talked about the millennials and you know, how, long, how would the millennials end up buying homes and, and why weren't they buying homes? Well that age group on average tended to marry later. They tended to have children later. And those are the things that are often the impetus to become a first time home buyer. And as we've seen that generation begin to have babies and do those things, we saw them begin to increase their home ownership on that. Um, 
There can be some things about financing and affordability, but I also think it ties to what are your expectations? Do you think that the home that you're going to buy as your first home is going to be the home that your parents live in today? That expectation also delays home purchase, right? And a lot, there are a lot of people out there who are renting awfully nice apartments that just don't want to go into a house that they don't think is as nice as what their apartment is, even though it would long-term be a good financial decision for them. So, yeah. And that's kind of what I saw that President Biden was proposing, but. Yeah, so the question is that then can we incentivize investors to put some of their stock that maybe they're not very happy with in, in, back into the market and in particular, I think there are folks with the National Association of Realtors that are proposing um, like a one-time you know, waiver of, of capital gains taxes to do that. Um, I am very leery of efforts to try and use tax policy to manipulate things. Um, what, is, what is best for financial markets and for housing markets and things long-term is to have a set of rules, low taxes, that are consistent and predictable, and you're not kind of whipsawing in and out. When you do that, the markets will take care of, you know, okay, no, I don't want to pay my 15% capital gains taxes, but it's not performing as an asset. I need to move the money somewhere else. I'm not going to switch it. I could do a tax-deferred exchange and switch it into commercial real estate if that was really the big deal that I had, but... Um, but if I wanted to get it out and I want to move it into Bitcoin because I'm stupid, um, then <laughs> I, 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 you know, at some point I'll just say, okay, I'll bite the bullet and I'll, I'll pay the taxes. So, yeah. Sure. So the question is, can we drill down into the price ranges and the things where this is happening, the price ranges where maybe it's not happening? Uh, my short answer to that is I fly over at a big picture level, and this is why everybody that I talk to that says, can you tell me about my house and my market? I say, go talk to a good realtor. Uh, because um, there are so many differences. You know, everything that we measure out here, uh, are at, we have averages, right? And those averages are right on average and wrong in every single instance. And so you have to understand your specific situation, you really have to understand what's going on in that local market. And I, I, I wouldn't want to jump in um, and, and speak too, too firmly about that. You know more about that than I would, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yes? So do I see a, an increase in the number of apartments that are going to be built? Um, my gut reaction right now is that we have probably seen that there's going to be a lull in new apartment construction activity, and that is directly tied to interest rates. Um, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Fed is, is, is basically done with their short-term interest rate increases is that they understand that it takes a long time for those interest rate increases that they do to be fully felt in the market. And so I've got an apartment project that I start, and it can take, what, a year, 18 months, maybe even two years to go from when I first pull the plug to say, yes, we're doing it, to when you're fully done. So we're only 12 months into this big increase we got a lot of projects and, and laborers, and once you know, it, it may be really painful for that investor because rates have moved against them, but once you've broken ground, you really can't stop. 
I'll be very surprised if we see a lot of new permits being pulled over the next couple of years. I think there's going to be a pause. You know, there'll be some, but, but there'll be a pause. That's my expectation. But uh, again, many of you may know better than I because you're actually putting dollars into those deals. I saw one more hand back there. It's uh, well known among this group that our local developers have long used special assessments as a way of financing street sewer and on and on and on. We're one of the few cities in the country that use special assessments the way we do. Our special assessments are very, very high right now. Do you see a time when which salt market is large enough to attract the type of developers or investors that would be able to pay for their developments to break down the cost of affordability of the house? So the question is about the use of special assessment financing and whether or not that would, uh, is, is be, that cost is going to be so high that if we had other developers from outside the market that didn't use it, that, that they might be able to lower those costs. A couple things to note. Number one is I believe Kansas is one of only two states in the country that allow special assessment financing to be used for new development like this. I think it's Kansas and North Dakota. And most communities in Kansas do take advantage of it. The thing to remember about what impact that would have on cost is that if you didn't have, let's say it's uh, $30,000 worth of infrastructure costs that have to go into building that new house. I don't know, does that sound ballpark right now? $30,000. If I did not have access to special assessments, then I would have to charge a higher price for the lot by at least that cost, plus my financing that I have with it. Then you, as the home buyer, would have to build that into your mortgage payment, okay? And you could only finance whatever percentage of the uh, sale price, you know, so if you're borrowing, you know, 95% of the purchase price, you could only borrow 95% of that infrastructure cost as a part of that. And the interest rate that you would pay would be the interest rate that you are paying for your mortgage, not the interest rate that the city uses on the special assessment bond, which benefits both from the fact that the city's a better risk than an individual mortgage holder and from the fact that those municipal bonds are a tax exempt from federal income taxes. So the real impact of that special assessment financing is to let you and me as home buyers finance 100% of the infrastructure cost at um, the city's financing rate. Now, the only thing that's a negative from my standpoint as a homeowner in this is that it can only be spread typically over 15 to 20 years. If the city was willing to do it over 30 years, which has challenges, then it would be an unquestioned cheaper monthly cost for homeowners than putting it into with that. The other thing that the special assessments have done for us that I think is actually a benefit is that it allows smaller developers to play the game. Does that make sense? And so I think that provides us with a richer, broader set of opportunities here than you get in some of the larger markets where you have the big national home builders that just kind of come in and steamroll through a market. So I think we've benefited from it. And when, when homeowners say, I just, I, I hate the specials, they're so expensive, they need to, the, the fact is, that's part of why their houses are less expensive to buy in the first place, is because that's what they're financing with it. So I saw one more hand over here. Yes. So the question is about the patio homes and, and the baby boomers kind of moving into independent living and, and moving out of those things. Uh, when I think of a patio home, here's what I'm thinking of. Slightly smaller footprint, smaller lot, uh, maintenance provided through the homeowners association with that. 
Um, often they're pretty big homes, right? It wasn't necessarily that they were these, you know, going to much, they weren't downsizing, they were upscaling, right? And so I personally have to believe that for all these first time buyers that want everything to be perfect and home ownership to be like it's living in an apartment, that would be the market I'd be looking at for those pieces. Um, because those, those, it's low maintenance living is what you're trying to buy with that. Well, that's what people are buying with apartments. So matter of fact, if I was trying to sell them, I'd go and put flyers about it in the apartment complexes and all these class A apartment complexes and point out to them how much they could afford to pay for this without that. Please don't tell the landlords here in town that I just said that. Um, in terms of demographics and all those pieces, I, I, National Association of Realtors does a much better job in terms of that. Those, those surveys to, to find those home buyer preferences and those pieces, those are very expensive. To, to do, and so it's a great benefit that the National Association puts that together. Um. Right, right, a lot of millennials don't want to do yard work, so I, I, I would think that would be a, an easy one to go and find the, the market for those homes. Um, matter of fact, maybe there'll be a new boom for them. So. Well, I think we have writ come close to our time, so I want to thank all of you very much. I have enjoyed it, and I appreciate all of you.